Happy New Year, all! But can we please pretend it's still Friday? Cheers. Welcome back, everybody, to me talking Christmas. It is <clears throat> technically the sixth day of Christmas, although it should be the eighth. I'm sorry, I'm late. Um, this stuff is taking way more time than I thought. But nevertheless, I want to give you this one, even though I'm pretty knackered and my voice is broken. Hence, even though I wanted to come back to the Twitter intro song, no song today. I can't sing. But let's talk about Sojourn, the third book of R.A. Salvatore's um, <clears throat> Dark Elf trilogy, and um, the sixth book in publication order of the Dark Elf novels around Driz Durden. Let's talk about that one. See how it works. I'll give you a quick synopsis, as usual, and then we'll talk about what it does, what it doesn't do, and uh, where I think it's a bit of a problem. Because, of course it's a problem. They're all problems. That's kind of the point here. All right, um, let's, let's do all of that um, right now. Sojourn follows up after exile with Drizdard and going to the surface all on his own. I mean, that's end. That's the end of Exile and Drizzt is sitting out there and watching the sunrise. And now <clears throat> we're, um, you know, following on from there. It does follow the same structure of, you know, five parts with introductions spoken by Drizzt, like first person introductions, and then stuff happening around it. Um, first of all, Drizzt tries to befriend some locals and try to figure out the rules of engagement on the surface. Then... <clears throat> Monsters around that place murder all the farmers he tries uh, to befriend, and Drizzt <clears throat> gets blamed for it. Drizzt kills the monsters and still gets hunted. That's kind of the first part of this story. Then the next part is Drizzt getting hunted, Drizzt finding a new master that teaches him all kinds of stuff, a new teacher, a ranger, and Drizzt becomes a ranger. And then Drizzt, after a large battle, moves slowly towards Icewind Dale, where he ends up meeting Catibri and, of course, Brunner Battlehammer. And that is where the story ends, which is where obviously the story of the crystal shard starts because this has been a prequel story or prequel trilogy so that's the structure nothing spectacular happening here and as i said we already kind of knew where this was heading um so let's talk a bit more about um the things that we see here and how they work the first thing that i found interesting is that this story once again begins with both Drizzt sitting on the rock and watching the sunrise and a monster, in this case, a Bargast, um, which is not the same thing as Bargasts in the Malazan world. Let me just make this very clear. Um, sitting on his mountain throne and gazing down. So we have that echo to both the beginnings of the Crystal Shard and um, Streams of Silver. But beyond that, um, the intro is not very interesting. And then we have, of course, that first part, um, Drizzt walking around. And I think it does kind of do something here that, well, was to be expected. And the structure in general, as I said, follows the plot very easily. We have several large-scale battles, a lot of battles once again, <laughs> very little magic, and then Drizzt ending up after an interaction with a, tr with a dragon that we'll talk about in a moment, um, ending up in Icewind Dale. So let's move straight to the, um, is this a Dungeons & Dragons story, and what, what kind of Dungeons & Dragons, what kind of Forgotten Realms stuff does it actually do? And, um, well, it showcases a shitload of monsters, I guess, is the first part here. Drizzt finally arrived at the surface, interacts with goblins, with Bargast, with weird quickling sprites, with orcs, with winter or dire wolves that can, you know, blast ice. He meets his first dragon, or first dragon in a chronological order, not in a publication order, of course and has some more interactions of that sort. He also talks or hangs out with bears and discovers that he is in fact a ranger and not just a fighter, which is kind of interesting compared to how he was uh, produced, uh, portrayed in uh, the first trilogy in publication order in the Icewind Dale trilogy, where he's basically a fighter. I mean, he's called a ranger, but he's not exactly doing ranger things. <laughs> we'll, we'll, we'll come back to that in a moment. So that's um, one thing. We get, you know, the, the full panoply of different monster species that are so, you know, part and parcel of fantasy 
play games in general, Dungeons and Dragons in particular, and obviously also hang out on in the Forgotten Realms. We'll talk about that further on. We also get our first hint of Forgotten Realms you know, cities on the surface. In this case, you know, a bunch of them get mentioned, including Silvery Moon, Akbar, so forth. The area in the north around, um, well, later on Mithril Hall is mostly the place here. Now, what is interesting about that is the way it is portrayed, because um, it's very American. Let me explain this. Um, we've talked about this before. I, I think I've mentioned it before that the way Dungeons and Dragons as a game runs is very much about taming the wild, which is a typical American um, myth, the myth of the frontier, the myth of, you know, manifest destiny and so forth. But usually the world in, in the Forgotten Realms, at least, you know, the Sword Coast and the North feels relatively European unless it becomes specifically American. And, you know, no big wonder there, um, since a lot of this stuff was influenced by Tolkien and other authors that were fascinated by medieval Europe, or Western Europe most likely. So there's usually that kind of feel. We already talked about how that is not the case with the Icewind Dale trilogy, uh, or at least Icewind Dale, where the barbarians are this weird mixture of um, Northern European, um, Norse uh, and sometimes Celtic barbarians and also uh, Native Americans. And we have another like very American feel here. See, where Drist hangs out in the spine of the world and there's that um, <clears throat> one outlying farm down there that he talks to with the Thistledowns. Is that their name? I think it's, the, the family is called Thistledown. Anyway, um, what's interesting is the kind of animals he encounters, which are skunks and raccoons. And while I have raccoons in Germany, because, you know, someone thought it a good idea to bring them from uh, North America to Europe, um, that's not a very European animal. Skunks are not European animals in that regard, which kind of gives that whole area more of a North American um, frontier feel than a, um, well, European um, uh, frontier feel. If you have, yes, you have like your, um, you know, outlying farmsteads which feel a little like you know little house on the prairie style although this is apparently more like um near a mountain range obviously and so forth but we also have someone like that bounty hunter that will be a driz nemesis throughout this book um sort of um, and that's kind of the through line through the story although compared to other plot lines or nemesis that driz is encountering roddy McGristle or whatever his name is, is not exactly a um, very powerful or interesting or meaningful character. We'll talk about his function in a bit. But it, the, the way he's put, uh, described is very much that mountain ranger, that mountain man that feels very North American in that regard, right? He runs around and he, he hunts monsters in the Rocky Mountains, basically. There is that feel to it, which is kind of interesting to me because it does and this may just be me, give a very different vibe than something set in, you know, a pseudo-medieval pseudo-Europe in a lot of ways. Just like from the way um, engagements are made between different species. And I think that's that's what we need to talk about today. We've, we've talked about species and uh, good and evil before, and we'll come back to it. But I think this is the book where it kind of shows a lot. All right. Dungeons and Dragons is about fighting monsters and taking their stuff with a lot of violence. So that's that's basics. <clears throat> to justify that, we have a lot of monstrous races. They're called races. I'll use the word here. I think it's not the, the ideal term, and I know it has been changed to something like kindred nowadays. Um, my point is, there's evil species and there's good species. And there's a, per, a constant war between those two. Or This is what this book claims. Good species are out to kill the bad species, because otherwise the evil creatures will just, like, you know, kill them all the time. Which is highly problematic on its own. We already talked about how there should be some more variety. We already talked about how that is certainly a problem with the drow as a supposedly sophisticated society that is also, you know, makes no sense because of its level of, you know, just pure evil. We'll come back to that in future books when drow are more of a concern. Today, however, we have, 
you know, other growths. We have goblins and giants hanging out in cave complexes. And then we have orcs. We need to talk about both of these groups. Now, one thing that is interesting is that the idea of having a bunch of goblins and one hill giant and those two bargas who are sort of like uber goblins um, with like magical powers and whatnot hanging out in the same cave complex. That's that's a very specific dungeon setup that we find a lot in, you know, old school D&D adventures like, say, uh, The Keep on the Borderlands, which has famously the Caves of Chaos out there where, you know, different groups of um <clears throat> creatures hang out together, some kobolds, some goblins, some orcs, and crazier shit if you ever play that adventure. It's, you know, it's, it's an interesting one. The point is, however, they just hang out together with the only goal being um, hunting and killing and eating humans. And like, okay, I guess if uh, your look at the world is that kind of kill or be killed, eat or be eaten sort of form of nature, that kind of makes sense as having, you know, different predators. The problem is, why would these kind of predators um, create societies and interact with each other? Which, you know, with the monsters layer, with that monster layout in, on layer in the first part of this book, um, the fight against, uh, you know, the, um, the Bargast and their gang, it's not that much of a problem. It becomes a problem when we're talking about the orcs. Because the orcs are obviously a whole tribe. They are, once again, they have shamans, they have their own gods and so forth. And once again, they're, they're described as a shamanistic sort of native society. But they're also evil and they're also stupid. And this is something that I haven't talked about before that much. But all the sort of evil creatures out here, or the quote-unquote evil creatures, the orcs, the goblins, and so forth, and a lot of the bad guys in the Underdark as well, are for some reason, also fundamentally considered as stupid. And we need to be aware of the fact that, A, Salvatore used the language stupid here. He's not talking about, like, any other form of describing that. He used the word stupid, which is a pretty demeaning, to put it mildly, for a group that is supposedly, you know, um, an intelligent species, like uh, the orcs are. Um, and with that come a lot of things, like, Taking an entire group of people, a species, an ethnicity, a race, whatever you want to use for a term, and calling them less intelligent is something we've had before. It's, you know, not something that is unheard of. There's a little book you might have, you know, come across. It's called The Bell Curve. It's, it's wrong. And it uses things like IQ, which is a made-up thing that we made up to feel cool as white people. Um, it uses that to fundamentally say that some groups, some ethnicities, are less intelligent. And we see that same idea of some races being less intelligent, some species being less intelligent, perpetuated. And um, it's something that comes up in, in Exile when they when Drizzt men, uh, meets a bunch of Durgar, those um, grey dwarfs, the evil dwarfs of the Underdark. And yeah, it's mentioned that they're all less smart. They're all more stupid than, you know, other dwarves and whatnot. And then it comes up with the Oryx being lazy, cowardly, and stupid, but also incredibly dangerous. Now, that's a um, bit of a problem right there. See, I don't know if you've ever, told, you know, read about Umberto Eco's ideas of dis defining fascism, um, but you don't even have to. There's a thing in a lot of racist discourse, in a lot of fascist discourse, where the enemy, whoever they may be, <laughs> are both despicable, weak, and so forth, but also incredibly dangerous at the same time, because you need to hate them and look down at them, but you also need to build up that constant threat. <laughs> now, once again, this is not a fascist, racist, overtly or purposefully racist, fascist, or whatever text. It's far from it. But we can see those same impulses, these same elements come up with the depiction of the Oryx, with the depiction of the Goblins, with the depiction of the Dwergar, of all these groups as being both an eminent threat that needs to be eradicated by humans or elves or dwarves immediately because they're so dangerous and predatory. But they're also always stupid. And this is something that is interesting because when they talk, they all talk in these terrible, broken accents, which brings us back to something that we've seen with um, The Lord of the Rings, and especially The Hobbit, with the trolls and the orcs there talking in what talking, well, thought of, or a, you know, working class accents from the time, which once again shows some very, pro, uh, you know, bad stereotypes, the idea of people, working class people being less intelligent and that being connected with evil is, well, it's, it's 
pretty fucking classes, is, uh, is it? And if you then also think of that working class people, those working class people as a different species, it turns out it's not only class, it's, it's classes, it's suddenly racist. And we see this happening in these, um, in these books again and again and again, because it's sort of at the base of older forms of Dungeons and Dragons, because these creatures started out as just, you know, monsters to be killed. And then when more and more layers of setting and world building and descriptions were added, they, you know, game designers developed what you might call, or it came up with sort of cultural backgrounds and so forth for Oryx, Goblins and so forth, right? But they kept that fundamental because they had to keep that fundamental, their monsters to be slaughtered. They are basically just, you know, <laughs> bits and pieces running around to take your players, um, player characters' um, uh, resources and provide other resources if they are overcome. That's what they are at, at the bottom. And that means you need to keep them as cannon fodder and as evil. And that's interesting in a lot of ways because these groups are usually built up as like one smart guy or one strongman ruler, maybe also a shaman, or even humans uh, manipulating orcs into doing all their dirty work and so forth. It's, it is fundamentally built in. We see it a lot happening in this book in the way this uh, is shows. Now, that's just one part of where, um, you know, we see um, fundamental Dungeons and Dragons and Forgotten Realms elements uh, come to the forefront and not necessarily make the book into a better book. Now, there's other elements here that I think are important. And that is, of course, um, Mushi, which is one of the worst nicknames ever come up with in role-playing games, but we'll talk about that. <laughs> Montolio, um, the, the old blind ranger who teaches um, Drizzt all the things. And of course, Drizzt turns out to be the most talented fucking ranger in, well, a very old guy's very long memory. At least, um, of course, because Drizzt is that level of uh, power fantasy. The interesting thing here is that it's the first time we actually talk more about a specific class. Uh, class being, of course, um, an archetype within Dungeons and Dragons, right? We have um, fighters, we have wizards, um, we have clerics, we have, which are the three introduced down in uh, the Underdark during uh, this trilogy. And now we get introduced to the ranger. There's obviously also thieves um, and, you know, a bunch more classes depending on, on what level of D&D and what edition of D&D you're talking about. But the ranger gets actually introduced with sort of gaming features and rules features being mentioned here. One of them being that rangers have a sworn enemy, which means that as if you play a ranger character, you can you get to pick one specific race <laughs> as your enemies and then you get some uh, some bonuses when you fight them or your character fights them and of course montolio has picked the orcs which yeah i will learn in a later book that drizzt has picked goblins for some reason but it's it's interesting that these books have no problem going like there's a racial enemy or a you know my, my personal enemy is everyone of this specific <laughs> cultural background this specific skin color culture whatever you want to call it basically being racist is a class feature of the ranger in the way it is portrayed here. The other part is, of course, um, um, <clears throat> religion being introduced. Uh, see, the Forgotten Realms, of course, have a lot of gods and goddesses and a lot of weird pantheons, which are important. Because the idea is that you pray to, a, to your god as a cleric, and that god grants um, you powers, spells. They're given by your god, and that god or that goddess can obviously take them away if you don't do what those gods want. It's something that is actually shown in the the underdark part with the uh, the clerics of Loth, uh, the, the priestesses of Loth. When they anger Loth, they can no longer actually use magic that well and so forth. It comes up again and again down there. But now we're up here. We need to also do things possibly overcorrect or correct for... Um, Things um, <laughs> rashly said in the Crystal Shard or, um, well, in the Icewind Dale trilogy, which means, you know, we need to explain why Drizzt finds a new goddess, which is Mieleki, the, well, goddess of nature in that regard. Um, which leads to some really interesting <laughs> theological debates about whether gods actually exist as manifestations or are all just facets of that one god uh, godlike being or come from within. Um, and it goes nowhere because it's just like a, a bunch of platitudes. 
But it's interesting because, no, in this game setting that you're talking about, Bobby Salvatore, these gods are actually real because they can give and grant powers. And we talk about how the Spider Queen Loth sits on this actual plane. You can go there and you can try to actually kill her if you feel like it. But maybe also gods don't exist and are just um, facets or names we give that one god. It's interesting because it kind of shows how um, stuff that Salvatore made up earlier needs to sort of be retrofitted within the larger part, of, you know, the larger Dungeons and Dragons universe, and sometimes that just doesn't work out well. Which I guess brings us to one thing that is important here. This is a pro this is obviously a prequel trilogy. Which means it's important to, um, you know, connect it to the first published uh, trilogy, that being the Icewind Dale trilogy. And overall, Salvatore does a good job of that. You know, we end up at the end there, he meets Caddy Bree, he meets Bruner. Um, over the entire trilogy, we have seen stuff that he mentioned in Icewind Dale show up here. We have the whole uh, the thing with the cave fisher around Guinevar being mentioned in Crystal Shard showing up here. We have a lot of these things. However, and this is something that will come up again and again throughout these books, Salvatore feels the need to tie up all loose ends. So everything he ever mentioned somewhere needs to come up again. So it, whenever you feel a character, you meet a character, and that character is still alive at the end of the book, he's most likely going to show up again because <laughs> characters that are not necessary for the plot will just not be mentioned usually. Um, case in point, um, <clears throat> Lady Illustrial's um, uh, sister, Fawn Falconhand, Dawn Falconhand, whatever her name is, um, she gets mentioned in a, you know, throwaway line by Illustrial in Streams of Silver when she talks to Drizzt and says, like, well, my sister is a younger ranger and she's in awe of you and kind of, you know, has made you into a bit of a hero. Yeah, now we get that pre-story as well when she gets actually asked to hunt Drizzt because obviously someone has killed all those farmers and they're drowned. She, she follows him and she kind of realizes that he's actually a good guy and so forth. And that's kind of unnecessary that because that neatness that kind of comes out of a story where every, every plot thread ever written, every character is always connected to everything else all the time. That is... It feels unrealistic, is my point. It also can lead to the character, uh, the writer having to make order and order and order choices to keep that whole thing spinning, that whole thing connected all the time, which does not necessarily make for better stories. Now, with Falkenhand, it's not that big of a deal. My main issue here is, of course, um, her friend Fred the Dwarf. See, we've talked about ideas of masculinity before. And they certainly come up within these books. Now, there's a dwarf, and he's a very undwarf-like dwarf, because he actually cares for manners and etiquette and good clothing and being, you know, polite and diplomatic and all those things. He's basically the opposite of Bruner Battlehammer in that regard. And he's heavily queer-coded. And I don't know if that's a good idea. <laughs> I mean, I know it's a really bad idea, is my point here. <clears throat> I just want to point that out, because we talked about how Magic users have always been portrayed as evil or ridiculous um, or both um, in uh, definitely as not very masculine, whereas fighters are obviously always the good guys here in these books and are always the heroes. And, you know, physical action and violence is um, the, the one and only way to um, actually, um, you know, <clears throat> solve problems. Now we have that dwarf and that dwarf is... All the cheap um, queer-coded comedy, uh, homophobic comedy you can imagine in that regard. He gets, you know, made fun of by everyone for, you know, just being a bit fussy and being possessed with, you know, these senses for etiquette and knowledge and so forth, instead of being another fighter, another gruff, um, you know, gruff uh, dwarf with a heart of gold. Instead, he's, you know, yeah, he's a homophobic stereotype, played for laughs throughout the entirety of the this book. Which is bad and kind of fits into that worldview that is, you know, the, the overarching uh, thing that I'm trying to explore here with these videos. Um, that levels of, you know, <clears throat> homophobia are added to the levels of misogyny, structural misogyny, uh, the levels, you know, the loving for casual cruelty, the idea that violence has to be inflicted with a certain amount of enthusiasm. All of these aspects come together and create this world. And... 
yeah, when we talked about this being fan fiction or similar to fan fiction, yeah, it's, it's very clear what kind of group would create this as a fan fiction to, you know, find a place where they can enjoy themselves. It is, obviously, mostly white, mostly, well, straight, um, middle class boys, mostly men. And I think it's important to understand this because these books obviously still appeal to uh, older readers who still think of them fondly and enjoy these jokes, enjoy the the cruelty when a bunch of wolves are burned to death and it's supposedly really funny when you, you know, make a giant self-impale himself. We will have more of those cruelty things in later books, but don't get me wrong. I think it showcases what kind of group falls for these kind of books, fantasy being escapism, right? In a lot of ways. And who escapes to the world of Drizdor, not the Forgotten Realms by playing their own adventures, but the world of Drizdor as portrayed in these books? Well, it's it's people who enjoy, you know, being casually cruel. It's people who enjoy making fun of queer-coded or less overtly masculine men. It's uh, people uh, making fun of women. It's people with all these ideas. And yeah, you know, you know what kind of people these these people are. And I think it's important to understand this, that a sincere love and appreciation for these books or the feeling that they can give you something that you can no longer have in your real life. It's why you need to go for escapism and fun entertainment. And you go to a book like this, a world as cruel as this. You only do that because you feel that you deserve to have that position of power, of privilege, where you can enjoy all these things and all that cruelty. And that's that's sort of the problem. If you're a new reader, a young developing reader or person, and this is part of what you consume during your formative years, it'll slowly turn you into the kind of people who will come to back to that in later years because they realize they can't be that kind of asshole in real life and then start yearning for the escapism that these books offer you. And I think there's something very tragic and sad with that, and it's something that needs to be pointed out because it's easy to dismiss this as, you know, not very well written um, fantasy, power, fan power fantasies for young men, but there's something here that keeps people coming back to these books. And that is, that's something we need to reckon with, and that's something we need to keep in mind. All right, let's do one or two more things before we leave all of this behind. <clears throat> one thing is, of course, once again, kind of connected to the idea of alignment or morals. See, the world that is built up here in this, and hilarious jokes, or not hilarious jokes, like misunderstandings when Drizzt doesn't want to kill anyone, so he almost falls in with a band of gnolls, um, which is another one of these goblinoid groups that are, get introduced here because they're you know, another staple of Dungeons and Dragons, because he doesn't want to kill them. And then, of course, we, you know, um, so we build up this idea that there are good races and bad and evil races, as Salvatore calls it here. Once again, that phrasing shouldn't, you know, should make us uh, stop and think hard. But we then realize that there are groups where there are both good and evil, people that have freedom of choice, which are, of course, the supposedly good races, right? Humans get to choose. Elves get to choose, and, and dwarves get to choose, technically, at least. But humans always get to choose, which is an interesting approach. And the way we do this here is by having Driz encounter two humans at the beginning, basically. One of them, of course, being um, Roddy um, McGristle, <laughs> the, the bounty hunter, who gets really obsessed with Driz. And on the other hand, it is, of course, Montolio, the wise old ranger, who teaches Driz even more things about humility and so forth. And I'll say this, um, because I try to also be nice, there's a lot of issues with the representation of Montolio as a blind ranger, and he's obviously overpowered and whatnot. But I think, compared to a lot of other stuff that uh, Salvatore gets incredibly uh, wrong, he's okay with the idea that that ranger doesn't want to pit want pity because, you know, of course, you know, <clears throat> that's not something that people with a disability want. We don't want pity. So he gets that part right. The idea of being annoyed by people underestimating you constantly. Those bits and pieces, there is some good stuff in here compared 
to you know a lot of the other terrible things in these books and i wanted to to mention that i think it's you know it, i would not hold this up as incredibly well done uh, disability um, <laughs> rep right that's not what it is but it could have been so much worse and it's not so hey well done, Salvatore, for once, you know, not fucking up completely. It's nice. And we have these two humans basically being Driz's first encounter with humanity and the idea that there's all kinds of stuff and you need to judge people on their individual morals. Which is something that is interesting because it's something, a courtesy that is not going to be extended to orcs, trolls, gnolls, goblins, and so forth. Because they're all evil and also cowardly at the same time and stupid. And yeah, I've said this before, I just wanted to reiterate how always these things are brought together when we encounter non-humans that are um, evil according to the book. We always get that uh, tri uh, that wonderful triumvirate of, uh, you know, stupidity, cowardice and evilness or cruelty for, for reasons. So with humans, they get to get judged um, as individuals, whereas anyone else gets the categorical judgment of, well, I guess they're orcs, so they're all evil. Will this change in later books? We'll find out. I just wanted to uh, show how even though the idea of showing that there are different alignments within human humanity comes at the expense of still racistly judging everyone else. The other part is, of course, that Roddy then develops this rage to and um, drive to hunt down Drizzt, which is poorly explained because, once again, R.A. Salvatore is not really good at coming up with motivations for characters or doesn't get the time or give himself the time to explain these and build these up, which is, of course, uh, sad. But it's why the idea of this story basically being drizzed, um, being hunted to the ends of the earth, to Icewind Dale by this one misguided, greedy human, because we need to obviously make, make sure that the one good drow has to flee there because of other people being bad to him and not because of, you know, actual racism, which may also be there. But it, at this point, he flees because he doesn't want to encounter very specific humans who are assholes to him. Which I think is sad because you could make a large argument about, you know, prejudice and so forth. And Salvatore always manages to kind of fuck that one up. Um, which leads us to the last bit that I wanted to talk about quickly, which is the priests of Ilmater, or the Sufferers. See, they get mentioned in one of these um, introductions by Drizzt, the, the first person thinks to part two or three, I think, in Streams of Silver. I think it might be part one, even, where he talks about hanging out with... Anyway, it's in one of the Icewind Dale books, he talks about walking or meeting on his way to Icewind Dale, meeting a group of followers of the God of Pain um, who try to inflict suffering on them. Now, what is interesting here is that it's a first time encountering clerics, so-called clerics, or at least monks or whatever you want to call them, religious people on the surface compared to religious people in the Underdark, which are obviously all evil because they're, you know, clerics of the Spider Queen. Here we encounter human clerics or human monks or whatever you want to call them, religious devotees. And they're all either mad or, well, <laughs> scammers pretending to suffer and, you know, being, you know, drunk and enjoying themselves all the time and being kind of criminals, which I don't know what your point is, Bobby Salvatore. Is it that you don't think that's a good gods? Obviously, the clerics of this sort of weirder faith, which is kind of modeled after, um, you know, certain um, parts of medieval and early modern religion where self-scourging and suffering was obviously a lot of, you know, well, not a lot of, like, it's one of the things, flagellation is something we really enjoy talking about and seeing as part of medieval religiosity, religiosity even though it was not necessarily that much of a big deal in piety and lay piety, but taking something that sincere and turning it into basically a mockery shows, once again, that callous disregard for actual motivations, for actually the things that actually make humans tick, because... Sincere faith, even though we as individuals, as writers, may not actually, you know, understand it or even think, it, uh, you know, critically of it, is still sincere human faith. And dismissing all of that because it makes for a bit of a joke if I'm having a bunch of drunk priests running around. 
once again, this is the first priest we encounter in, in on the surface, because there's no clerics of any form and no religion at all being mentioned in the Icewind Dale trilogy. Um, <clears throat> feels kind of weird, because why why are <laughs> why are treacherous um, grady priests the first people you think of when you think of clerics, um, Bobby Salvatore? Is that really how you want to present um, the really interesting, uh, or the, not interesting, but the largely religious world of the Forgotten Realms? Is that really the way to go? I don't know. And then, of course, we need to talk about Hephaestus before we end this. Hephaestus, the dragon, that's kind of lazy. And actually, even though he's supposedly an evil dragon, makes money by, you know, melting ore and working with merchants, that's actually a really cool setup. That's a really cool character idea. It's, it's really funny the way, uh, the fact that he's apparently also really stupid and can be tricked by Drizzt in ridiculous ways. Yeah, I get it. You wanted to play around with the whole um, Bilbo Baggins talking to Smaug idea on yeah, it doesn't work. See, that's that's part of the problem. It's like paying homage is one thing, but paying homage to something you have not fully understood as a writer or as a reader. It's not that good, is my point. And that whole scene seems to be put in there to A, um, kind of recreate the scene of Bilbo talking to Smaug. In this case, it's Drizzt talking to um, the red dragon by pretending to be a black dragon caught in the polymorph spell. And it's an incredibly elaborate setup to make that whole thing work, only to then have Drizzt obviously be incredibly overpoweredly quick and smart and so forth to outwit the dragon in a supposedly more awesome way than, you know, Bilbo does in The Lord of the, the Hobbit. I think it shows something here. It shows, once again, that level of immaturity that is so key to these books and obviously comes through in how incredibly overpowered Drizzt as a character is and how incredibly overpowered the other good characters always are. It's that idea that making something more, it makes it better. Whereas, you know, the whole the whole scene between Bilbo and Smaug kind of works because one knows he's obviously going to die if he slips up in any way. There's a level of, you know, naivete going on with Bilbo doing something. He gets almost caught out when he tries to actually, you know, um, mock uh, or be clever towards Smaug and he almost gets burned and so forth. The scene works because Bilbo is clearly so underpowered, but this is Drizzt. If we've read in publication order, he has already helped defy a defeat two dragons. Dragons are not invincible within these books because, uh, you know, Salvatore likes to show dragons that get killed all the time. So that level of fear is not there. And then Drizzt outsmarts the dragon by all these things. And that doesn't make the scene better. That doesn't do anything except, you know, showcase that <laughs> the, in the world of R.A. Salvatore, in the world of Drizzt, certain characters cannot be in any real danger ever because they are so overpowered. And that's kind of, I think, at the core of that level of power fantasy. The thing that when people criticize a Mary Sue character or a Gary Stu character, whatever phrase you want to use, what makes people be so critical of that is that that level of invulnerability makes the story not very engaging to read. And when you use that to basically recreate the scene of one of your favorite books or a book that has been incredibly formative for oh so many of your readers, and you take the same scene and then showcase how your character is so much better at doing all of this, you're ruining it for a lot of people. And I think that's something that you can see within that Hephaestus scene. Obviously, the calling the dragon Hephaestus joke, and like, yeah, he's named after an obscure god of smiths. Yeah, I get it. And of course, um, Greek um, pantheon parts have always made their way into um, Dungeons and Dragons from time to time, so I get it. It's a fun joke, especially because he likes, you know, melt ore for other people. It just, once again, shows a level of immaturity on the level of the writer that, as I said, kind of connects with all these other parts of these books. The casual cruelty, the, the love for ridiculous violence and vindic vindictiveness that is part and parcel of these books. All of these things kind of show are coming together here again. It's like, these are books 
where they may be targeted towards a younger audience, but they are so either because the person writing these books is even more immature as a person or does not think very highly of their audience and thinks what they need to write to engage people, uh, young adults, young boys, adolescent boys, is to, you know, heap piles of cruelty, um, terrible jokes, um, well, not even good terrible jokes, don't get me wrong, cruelty, misogyny, homophobia, and all these other things on them. And as I said, that's either dismissive or just showcases what a terrible person or what, what a terrible image of their audience the writer has. And I don't know where to go with this. I think it's really sad. But, as I said, the story ends in Icewind Dale, and we'll come back very soon, and then we'll find out what happens after the Halfling's Gem. And I don't know if that will be any better. I mean, I do, <laughs> and I know it's going to be worse. Um, but until then, <laughs> thanks for sticking with me, even with the delays. Drismas is, being, is turning out to be much more than I bargained for. I'll do my best to catch up. We'll see you tomorrow when I'm hopefully a bit more rested. But, you know, as they say, the drizzed has to go on. <laughs> Thanks for watching. Cheers.